Hello, public speaking students. So far, we've learned basic speech writing. We've learned the sandwich format. We've learned about attention getters, captivators, transitions, clinchers, all kinds of important things that make a speech coherent and easy to follow. But one of the things that I've been saying throughout this course is that public speaking is supposed to be a conversation between you and the audience. Maybe one where you do most or all of the, con all of the talking, but still there's opportunities for the audience to get involved. Well, there's a set of techniques that are geared towards getting the audience involved in your speech to give it that conversational feel. And in this lecture, I'm gonna tell you about these techniques and show you how to use them. And we'll also talk about a few other related things to delivery. Let's do it. There are a set of techniques that I call audience engagement techniques. Audience engagement techniques are techniques that get the audience involved, okay, in the speech. They get the audience actively involved in the speech. Essentially, audience engagement techniques ask the audience to do something other than just sit there and listen. Okay? So that's what makes audience engagement techniques audience engagement techniques. Now, we talked earlier about captivators and attention getters and such. So attention getters do generally do not involve getting the audience involved. Attention getters are things like using a quote, telling a story, doing a demonstration, and so forth. Audience engagement techniques are a specific set of attention getters where you're gonna be asking the audience to do something and the audience moves from a passive group to an active group. Because here's the idea. If you can get your audience from a passive mode where they're just sitting there and listening to an active mode where they're actively doing something, they're gonna be more likely to engage the speech and pay attention because they have to do something. They can't just sit there and melt. They have to be on the edge of their seats waiting for your next commandment or your next uh, thing that you want them to do. So audience engagement techniques make the audience wanna participate. They make them wanna listen, if for nothing else, because of the things that you're gonna ask them to do. So the more involved you get the audience, the more likely they're gonna stay involved and they're gonna pay attention and they're gonna get your message and the more conversational it's going to feel. Now, what are some audience engagement techniques? Well, I'm gonna give you a list here. I'll talk about each of them. First, you can always take a poll. When you take a poll, you ask the audience to declare something. Usually it goes something like, how many of you commute to school? So. There are different methods for how people, you can ask people to tell you this. You can say, by a show of hands, how many of you commute to school every day? Or, by a show of thumbs, how many of you like the last Marvel of the series movies? And then so everyone holds up their thumbs. Or you can do by a show of applause. By a show of applause, how much did you enjoy that show? And then everyone goes like, Woo! you know, that kind of thing. Or you can do shout out. So if you wanna do some kind of like, so shout out, how many of you say, oh yeah, if you've done X, Y, Z before? And then everyone goes, oh yeah, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, show out, shout outs. You can ask people to show objects. So maybe you hand everyone like a glass. So raise your glass if you have ever drinking, drunk uh, white wine instead of red wine or whatever, whatever the, the topic is. And everyone like raises their glass or something. I've even had a student who did show of smiles because his speech was about depression. So he said, by a show of frowns, how many of you have experienced, you know, some kind of feeling before? And then everyone kind of made this frowny face. Now by a show of smiles, how many of you had a friend who was there to tell you that it was okay? And then everyone kind of smiled. So when you take a poll, the idea is this, you ask a question and you provide a method to answer collectively so the method has to be one where it makes it's, it's easy for the audience to collectively do it. So usually show of hands is what people do. But like I said, you can be creative and come up with thumbs, glasses, smiles. You can be as creative as you want in terms of how you do the poll. Just think logistics, that's all. Now, if you do a poll, there are some things you got to keep in mind. First, make sure you give the audience time to respond. Okay, so give the audience time. So if you ask a question, how many of you ride the bus to school every day? 
Well, today we're going to do, see, there was no time for us to really raise our hands, right? So you want to give everyone a chance to respond. You have to create a little pause for that to happen. Secondly, you got to respond to the poll. So this is another thing. Respond to the poll. So if you ask people, how many of you take the bus to school? And let's say 80% of the class raises their hand. You want to take a moment to respond to that high number. So you'll probably say, oh, okay, so quite a bit of you, the vast majority of you here, take this bus to school. Versus, what if you ask that question and only two people raise their hand and there's 30 people in the room? Then you probably want to have a response to that as well. So you might say, okay, so only a few of you take the bus to school every day, but you all recognize the importance of the bus, right? And then you have a response to that. Here's the idea. You got to respond to the poll because otherwise it just seems so mechanical. What if somebody just said, how many take the bus to school? Well, today we're going to talk about how the busing system is important to blah, blah. Like it doesn't, like, why'd you even ask us? If you're not going to reply or if you're not going to use the, the results in any way, if you were just going to, regardless if five people raise their hand versus 200 people raise their hands, it doesn't matter. Then the poll is very mechanical and useless. Right, so you want to respond to the poll. You want to, however they, the, the whichever way it goes, you want to have a response ready. And then, lastly, justify the poll. Why did you bother asking us? So tie the poll back to the topic. Let us know why you asked. And if you want, you can follow up with another question. So taking a poll is very basic. Everyone does it when my public speaking classes at least once throughout their speech. They take some kind of poll. What's nice about it is when you do the poll, you have a lot of control still because all you ask people to do is to raise their hand or raise their thumbs or so and whatever, and you can reply to it however you want. So that's why a lot of people like it because it's pretty safe. It's a pretty safe engagement technique to do, but at least you're getting your audience involved. You're asking them to raise their hands. So to follow up on that, you can also do a discussion question. So this is a different audience engagement technique. So you have taking a poll and then you have discussion questions. And a discussion question is where you ask a question of the audience and you take answers, open-ended answers. So you might say, um, has anyone here ever been on a bad date? And then maybe some people will raise their hands. Okay, who would like to share their bad date experience? And then you call on somebody and then somebody quickly shares their bad date experience. So there you've created a discussion question. So the idea is that you always make them open-ended when you do an, uh, a discussion question. And then allow silence for a response. Okay, you got to give people a second. Now, let's say you say you ask that question. How many of you have been on a bad date before? Okay, who would like to share? And nobody's raising their hand. Then one thing you want to make sure is you always want to be ready to volunteer your own story. So maybe nobody in your nobody in your class or nobody in your room has been on a bad date. So you should already have a bad date story ready to go. So if nobody said, so you say, how many of you have been on a bad date? And it's like crickets in the room. Okay, well, while some of you recall, um, when I went on a bad date one time, in fact, it was at Red Lobster and blah, blah, blah. And then you tell your story about how you had a bad date at Red Lobster. Okay. You got to prepare for scenarios though. And this is part of learning public speaking and learning to be a discussion leader. If somebody talks too long or if somebody has a story and it's kind of inappropriate, you should have some responses ready, some canned responses to that to respond. And then lastly, you want to summarize the discussion after it's over and tie it into your speech. So this requires a little bit of impromptu too, because you don't know what exactly people are going to say when they give their bad date stories, but you should already in your, in your head kind of know where you're going to take this discussion in terms of relating it to your speech. So after maybe I hear two or three bad date stories, I might say, so a common theme to all of these stories and to bad dates in general is that there were some expect expectations violated. Today, I want to teach you the theory of expectations, ex the theory of expectancy violations and how when we have expectations that aren't met, there are different ways we attribute meaning to those events. Okay, and then go into the speech. So that would be a discussion question. Asking the audience a question, letting people answer, setting a time limit on it, you know, watch the clock, those kinds of things, and then tying the discussion back to the, the point that you're about to make. Now, there are some other things that we can, there are some other audience engagement techniques that we can use here. So we have, we have plenty more. 
a third technique is close your eyes and technique, okay? Close your eyes and what? Well, the most common one is close your eyes and imagine. So what you're gonna ask the audience to do is you're gonna say, I want everyone to close your eyes and imagine it's 20 years from now. And 20 years from now, you are working a job, you wake up in the morning to an alarm clock and you realize that you have to go to work in an hour. And imagine that the job that you work is one that you love. It's one that you feel excited about and every day you walk into the office, you, you feel like you're part of a community and that your work is meaningful. How would you feel in that moment, knowing that every day before you go to work, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be going to a, work, a, a job that you absolutely love and feel part of? Okay, so you see how closing your eyes imagine, and then maybe I'll take it from there. So today, I'd like, to, I'd like you to consider working for my company, and then, you know, and then it's a recruitment pitch for why you should work at blah, 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 okay? So close your eyes and imagine is then where you're getting the audience to close their eyes and imagine something. But you can also do close your eyes and reflect. So maybe you'll ask the audience to close their eyes and reflect upon a past experience that they've had. So maybe close your eyes and reflect upon a time when you felt like a total champ, like you were on top of the world. Reflect on what caused you to feel that way. Was it winning a sport? Was it asking out that attractive, significant other, you know, whatever, okay? So close your eyes and reflect. Okay, and then you tie the, that little exercise into whatever your speech is gonna be or whatever the point is that you're gonna make. And you're also able with this to create a discussion. So you can chain two audience engagement techniques, close your eyes, and then have a discussion after that if you want. So you could be that hardcore. And then that's really engaging at that point. And then you have close your eyes and think about. So this would be something like a brainstorming session where, you know, close your eyes and think about a world where you could have anything that you want and you could get it easily and quickly. What would that world look like? You know, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay, so think about. Either way, the close your eyes part's important because you're asking the audience to really focus. Focus on your words and to focus on what it is that you're telling them to think about. Now, when you do close your eyes, there's a couple things you gotta remember. Number one, use vivid imagery, okay? Especially when you do close your eyes and imagine, you don't want to use a bunch of abstractions like close your eyes and imagine you're driving and you stop at a stop sign and you get out of the car and you go to the store and you uh, buy tomatoes. Okay, so like it's just too abstract. Like, okay, why am I imagining? You, you know, it's not vivid enough. You want to tell something that's like really vivid. Like I remember I had a student and it was like she was doing her speech on dog shelters or like why you should adopt shelter dogs. And she was like, you know, imagine that you're a little person and you're in a cage and every day, you know, and then like, just like this whole thing about being in a cage, like I can't even reenact it because it's just so crazy. But it, you really felt, you really felt like, oh God, it must be horrible to be a dog. Like if you're in this little tiny cage and every day people walk by and they look at you and then they just keep walking, even though you really want to get out of there because the cage is small and it smells and okay. Yeah. So definitely that. But the other thing about close your eyes, and this is really important, um, don't forget to tell people to open, okay? So when you do close your eyes and imagine, a lot of people, they'll like, you know, close your eyes and imagine and blah, 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 blah. And then they'll start getting into their speech, but they never told us to open our eyes up again. So we're still closing our eyes when they're like, you know, deep into the speech. So you gotta remind us, you gotta tell us not only when to close our eyes, you gotta tell us when to open our eyes too. So you always say something like, closing your eyes and imagine, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you can open your eyes now, blah, 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 blah. Okay, whatever it is that you were gonna say, okay? So you gotta remind people to open. Next. Another kind of discussion technique you can use is called think, pair, Share, or excuse me, square. Oh, I messed that up. Come on. Okay, all right. Think, pair, square, 
share. Here's how this works. When you have the audience that isn't very talkative or just isn't really opening up to you, you first have them think about something. So here's how it might go. You might say to the audience, I want everyone to think of a time when someone did a random act of kindness for you. So everyone, just for a second, think to yourselves, when was the time somebody did something really kind for you? And it was just, let's just say, kind of random. Okay, now that you've thought of it, what I'd like you to do is pick, pair with somebody next to you and tell them about your experience. So then what you'll do is you'll have everyone, everyone will kind of find a partner, you know, somebody next to them, and you want to give them like 30 seconds to a minute to talk about their experience. Okay, so now let's say they've, everyone is like, you know, has turned to each other and they've talked a little bit and it's been like maybe 30 seconds or so. Okay, so now we're speaker again. So I'll say, okay. All right, so now that you shared with a partner, what I'd like you to do is to now share with two more people. So find another set of partners and have everyone share your experiences. So that's square. So square is, so think is one person, pair is two people, square is four people now. So now you'll allow another minute or so to let people square and let people share their ideas that way. After that time has passed, then you do share. So going back to speaker mode, I would say, okay, now that you've shared in your groups, or now I'd like to hear some of your ideas. So who would like to share their ideas for the general audience? Now share is gonna be, you know, five plus however many people, okay? How many people in the room? So in share, you're asking the groups to share for the whole audience. Here's the idea. When it's just by yourself, it's really hard to get people to wanna participate because they don't know if their ideas are good, they don't know, they need validation and all those other things. But when you make people pair, that forces them to articulate their ideas to somebody else. And a lot of times, the person that they articulate them to then gives them the validation and confidence that they need to share. Then if you do square, and you don't always have to do square, a lot of people skip square because of time, that person is going to get even more validation because they're going to have more groups and more people to talk, run the ideas by. And if you're doing a brainstorming session, square is really nice. And then share, when by the time the person has thought about the idea, shared it with one person, then shared it with three more people, by the time you get to share with the whole audience, that person might now have the confidence to go in front and share with everyone. So that's the power of think, pair, square, share. It, it allows people to get warmed up to sharing and it doesn't, you don't have all those awkward moments where like maybe nobody's raising their hand and such. And this gives people a chance to think about it, to brainstorm, and then eventually get everyone else involved. Now, the big tips here is you wanna make sure the task is specific. So if it's just thinking of a question or thinking of an idea of something, that's pretty easy. You wanna have a way to reclaim the audience too. The problem with think, pair, square, share is sometimes the room gets really loud. So you might need a bell or just have some easy way of making sure you can reclaim the audience because otherwise people will keep talking and it gets really loud. And just remember with, with share, you don't have to call on everyone. So you might end up in a situation where you'll get 12 people who wanna share their ideas, but you have a, a strict time limit. The best thing to do is just try to call on maybe three or four people. And if you look at the time and it's passed, you just say, I appreciate all the others of you who wanna share, you know, maybe at the end we'll, we'll come back to that. So just appreciate the people who raise their hands and just say, sorry, I gotta move on. All right. The next technique so I'm trying to make some space here, trying to delete, delete. Okay, cool. All right, so the next technique is called audience recitation. Now, you might have noticed this in the sample speeches in the first week. Remember the do you validate and everyone did cha-ching? That's audience recitation. Basically, you have the audience recite a phrase of some kind throughout the speech. So you have to first plant the phrase though. You can't just be like, you know, fill in the blank because nobody's gonna know what to say. You have to make the phrase known and you have to say it yourself one or two times throughout the speech. And then you can start tipping the audience for them to fill in the blank. This is hard to show like in this format of presentation, but just plant a phrase that's easily 
sayable, maybe three or four words long the most. Okay, it can't be a long sentence. And then give them an opportunity to recite it. So that is an audience engagement techniques. You can also use a plant. A plant, not like a house plant, but a plant is someone in the audience who's prearranged to do or say something that is part of the speech. I've had, I've had it so that some people, they have a plant who will say something in the middle of the speech or they'll ask a question or they'll be a volunteer that you've already picked out. The thing about plants is that it's a lot of people use those because they're afraid of any other kind of audience engagement. So, and I, I, there's been times when it's been really bad too. Like very obviously this person was a plant where it's like, I need a volunteer. And they're already looking at one person and that person's already getting up. Like, okay, so then at that point, just call up your plant at that point. So if you're gonna use a plant, don't be ashamed to use them and just say, I've, I've selected you know, Chris to come up here and help me with blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, that's using a plant. The problem is if, that's, if you use a plant, it's not, it's sort of engagement, but it's like prearranged engagement. So if you use a plant in your speech, I'd still wanna see another type of audience engagement technique to see that you're willing to give up some control. Next, asking for a volunteer. So this is the opposite of using a plant. It's asking someone in the audience to come up and do something hands-on and then letting you show them. The big thing with asking for a volunteer is just make sure they're capable you know, make sure that they are somebody who you can think that can actually do the thing that you want them to do. Also, you can just address people directly in the audience, okay? So we often call this a call out. So literally in your speech, you just call out someone in the audience. So you're giving a speech about cars and maybe there's this guy named John and like in his previous speech, he talked about how he runs over people or something. And then you can be like, this is a speech about cars. Now, I know John from a previous speech said that he likes to run over people. Okay, John's a bad guy. Um, but, you know, today we're going to learn about cars and how to use them safely. Okay, boom. So you call out somebody in the audience or you even call on them to volunteer. Hey, John, what's one of the most important things about selecting a car? You know, blah, blah, blah. And boom, you just put John on the spot. That's all good. You can put people on the spot. This is your speech. Okay. So call out people, you know, ask people in the audience, mention people from the audience. Just be nice. Be kind. Don't be rude. Those kinds of things. All right. So these are a bunch of different audience engagement techniques that you can use. You have to use these in your speech. You are graded on using audience engagement techniques in your speech. Audience engagement techniques throughout your speech can serve as captivators because they are attention grabbing. So audience engagement techniques can serve as attention getters. They can also serve as captivators. They can sort of serve as clinchers if you know how to clinch right. But either way, you gotta have these specific techniques in your speech along with captivators, attention grabbers, and clinchers. Okay, because these are what make your speech conversational and interactive. So these are audience engagement techniques. Use these throughout your speech. Use them powerfully. Use them effectively. And you're going to be one heck of a speaker.